Our scripture lesson this morning comes from 2 Samuel chapter 18, verses 5 through 9, 15, and 31 through 33. The king gave orders to Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, for my sake, protect my boy Absalom. All the troops heard what the king ordered regarding Absalom to all the commanders. So the troops marched into the field to meet the Israelites. The battle was fought in the Ephraim forest. The army of Israel was defeated there by David's soldiers. A great slaughter of 20,000 men took place that day. The battle spread out over the entire countryside, and the forest devoured more soldiers than the sword that day. Absalom came upon some of David's men, and Absalom was riding on a mule, and the mule went under the tangled branches of a large oak tree. Absalom's head got caught in the tree. He was left hanging in midair while the mule under him kept on going. Ten young armor bearers of Joab surrounded Absalom, struck him, and killed him. Then the Cushite arrived and said, My master, the king, listen to this good news. The Lord has vindicated you this day against the power of all who rose up against you. The king said to the Cushite, Is my boy Absalom okay? And the Cushite answered, May the enemies of my master, the king, and all who rise up against you to hurt you end up like that young man. The king trembled. He went up to the room over the gate and cried, as he went, he said, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, my son, O oh, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. <coughs> so we've, um, we've been talking out of... Uh, 2 Samuel for a while now, so some of y'all probably aren't real surprised about how strange and crazy this story sounds. Um, but here it is. Uh, this is the story of King David. This is a part of King David's story. King David uh, that we revere, that we trace Jesus' lineage back to. This is King David. Last week, we talked about... Uh, David's actions with Bathsheba and Uriah, how David committed adultery with Bathsheba and then killed Uriah by sending him into battle and pulling his troops back. And in the context of that passage, God, through the prophet Nathan, pronounces a curse on David and his family that from among David's own family, struggle Rebellion, betrayal would rise up. This passage we just read is the conclusion of that betrayal because in the chapters in between that passage about Bathsheba and David and Uriah and this one that we read this morning, we hear the stories of David's sons. It begins with David's oldest son, Amnon, who um, got it in his head that he needed his sister Tamar, that he needed to have sex with her. And he does, against her will. But her brother, Absalom, takes offense at that. Kind of obviously. Um, we're all kind of on Absalom's side at this point in time, um, as you're reading, if you're reading along with me at least. But Absalom doesn't do anything for a long time because David chooses not to punish Amnon. And so the story continues, and Absalom continues in David's household as his son, but slowly and surely makes plans to get Amnon to a place where the king's guards aren't there. He sets a feast, a banquet. All of his other brothers are there. And he tells his servants, when I tell you, I want you to kill Amnon. Don't worry about it. I'm giving you the orders. 
Just do it. So Absalom's servants kill Amnon at his word. And Absalom, well, all of his other brothers start running like crazy. Um, can you imagine being one of them? Woo! Um, this party just got strange. Um, and so they start running. They take off to go tell dad. And uh, Absalom takes off and runs to his grandfather, who's the king of another country uh, not far off. And he stays there for a while until David's anger cools down. And then Joab, we hear a little bit about him in this uh, passage. Joab, a wise woman, um, convinces David that, hey, you should really invite Absalom to come back. Your anger has cooled. Uh, he's your heir. You should really invite him back to Jerusalem. And so he does. Uh, but apparently Absalom's thirst for vengeance isn't done yet. Uh, and so he starts um, slowly and methodically turning the hearts of the Israelite people to him instead of to David. And then he convinces David, let me go. David still doesn't quite trust him, but he says, let me go and take a bunch of folks out to Gershon, um, and I'm going to make an offering to God there because I promised God I would if I ever got to come home. So he takes all these people out there, and while he's out there, he starts convincing other people to come over to his side, major players in Israel. And all of a sudden, the rebellion and revolt is born. And Absalom has turned the hearts of the people from David. And David hears about it, and he flees Jerusalem. And he leaves, and he goes out into the countryside and Absalom takes over the city and does uh, some unspeakable things um, in order to assert his power and authority over David, his father. And then they enter into battle with one another. David's men versus the men of Israel. And that's how we get here. That's how we made it to our passage for this morning. The final battle between Absalom, the son, and David, the father. So you can imagine that as we reach this passage in 2 Samuel, things are complicated. That's why as this passage opens... David sits his three generals down and pleads with them not to kill his son, the one in open rebellion, the one who's killed his brother. Things are complicated. But as we read the story and as we get to this point, we realize that at least I hope we do, that David bears some, if not much, of the responsibility in all that has taken place. But then again, so does Absalom and Joab and Amnon, for that matter. But then, as we look at it and read about it and hear about it, to me at least, it, it just seems like some of this stuff just stinks, um, to put it nicely. And that's kind of the point of this sermon. Stuff happens. Y'all yeah, remember that scene in Forrest Gump? He's running across the country, and he steps in stuff. Um, and the guy says, well, you just stepped in that stuff. He goes, well, it happens. And a bumper sticker was born. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> stuff happens. Um, stuff happens. We often ask, why do bad things happen to good people? David, after all, is called a man after God's own heart. Doesn't seem to get any better than that. Why do bad things happen to good people? And sometimes, sometimes as hard as it is, the answer has to be a good hard look at the actions, decisions, and beliefs of the person to whom the bad thing is happening. Because often the answer is right there in their life story. If you ask why do bad things happen to David, a man after God's own heart, the answer is pretty easy. The actions that David took when he was a young father 
uh, pretty well parallel and mimic some of the actions that Absalom and Amnon take. Seems like they might have learned that behavior. And then it came back to haunt David. Sometimes, sometimes the swords and the traps and the violence that we, uh, we do in our own lives comes back to us. But other times, the only real and honest answer is stuff happens. Stuff happens in life over which we have no control. Stuff happens in life that just stinks to high heaven. And God doesn't want it to happen, but it's a part of this broken and fallen world that we live in until Christ comes again in glory. I mean, think of the luck of Absalom. You know, he successfully rebelled against David, the greatest king in the history of Israel. It's the second, but still, he carried that on later. Um, and... Here he is, he's in battle, and he's riding along, and his head gets stuck in a tree. Stuff happens. And then he's stuck there, defenseless, and he's killed. And David is grief-stricken. There's no opportunity for Absalom to be saved, redeemed, brought back. Last week we talked about how important it is to have uh, Nathan in your life. Uh, Nathan was the prophet that called David to accountability. And um, this is a part of what, it, what makes it so important to have somebody who can call you to account in your life. Because often it's hard for us to see where our own responsibility begins and ends in any given situation especially without someone who knows and loves us to hold us accountable. It's hard to know how have my actions led to this and how has some of it just been the fact that life sometimes stinks. Got to have somebody. But despite all that, in the midst of it all, whether the forest gets you, or the sword, whatever it is, however it comes about, in the midst of it all, we're supposed to be Christ-like. And that's the really good news. That's the really great news in all of this, is that we can be Christ-like because God is with us, because Christ is with us, Emmanuel, because Jesus Christ is with us. And we can be Christ-like in the midst of of all the bad stuff that comes at us, just like David. Because here we have all of this stuff, all of this stuff, some of which is David's own fault. Some of it is just way out of his control. Here we have David, the king of Israel, who has just descended into this place, this rock bottom kind of place in his own life. And still, still he wants to offer grace and mercy to his enemy. Still, when he hears the news that Absalom is dead, he goes upstairs and grieves and yells and weeps over the fact that he won. So it turns out that discipleship, being a part of the ministry and mission of God, is not about never having anything bad happen. It's not about worrying why do these bad things happen. It's about responding in a Christ-like way when it does. See, that's the difference between Absalom and David. 
Absalom let the bad things that happened in his life fester and smolder in his soul to the point that they boiled over into rebellion, rape, and war. David, on the other hand, confessed, accepted his role in the disastrous consequences that fell on him, and grieved each new loss as it came. Absalom, in the end, was killed by the forest and the sword, and David lived to old age. This story is hard to hear and harder to draw wisdom from, but it's a part of who we are. It's a part of our scripture, and it's a part of who we are as Christians, as Methodists, as the people of God, to learn to accept both our guilt and to accept accept that stuff happens in life that we can't control. More importantly, once we've accepted those things, to realize that it doesn't matter how it gets to us, it's about how we respond. It's about responding in a Christ-like way all the time, in the good and the bad. It's about loving our enemies even when they press upon us. It's about having someone in our life that can show us, you know what, you had a little bit to do with this. And who can also say, you know what, you had nothing to do with this. And then sometimes it's both. But it's not all one way or the other. A lot of times we want to wait to respond to the bad things that happen in our lives until we get answers to why God let them happen, to why they happened, to what happened. But it turns out it's not as important the why it happened as the how we respond. This table behind me is set for us to come and have communion with with God, with Jesus Christ. To come to know the grace and peace and love of God through His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. But in order for us To have this table, Christ had to respond to the bad things that happened in his life because of what we did. Christ had to respond in a way that led him to his death, that lifted him up for our sakes, and that made the grace and love and peace of God available to all of us through the power of his death and resurrection. This table is a testament to how we are to respond as Christians. We come and we dine, we taste the body and blood of Christ, we get a foretaste, a sign of the coming kingdom of God, and we remember, we know and we are formed by, and hopefully we live out being disciples, being Christ-like, responding to the things that happen to us in ways that show the love and the grace and the mercy of God to all that we meet. So now we're going to come to the table. The Lord be with you.